Hey y'all, it's your math teacher, Mr. Boyden. We're back at it again today, and today we're going to be learning about geometric series. Last time we talked about arithmetic sequence and series, and what that meant is that our pattern was addition. So geometric series then, that's going to be denoted by a pattern that is multiplication. So let's start with my favorite example of a geometric series. An infinitely large group of mathematicians walks into a bar, and because we're a high school class, they're going to drink water. And the first one walks up to the bar, and they ask for one glass of water. Says, I'd like one glass of water, please. Sure, not a problem. The next mathematician walks up to the bar and says, I'm thirsty, but I'm not as thirsty as the first mathematician. So she says, I would like a half glass of water. Okay, not a problem. Next one walks up. I'm also thirsty, but I don't need as much as the last person. I really just need a quarter of a glass of water. And the next one says, I need an eighth of a glass of water and so on. I need a sixteenth of a glass of water, please. Now, that makes things a little tough <clears throat> on the person behind the counter because they don't have infinitely many glasses, and yet there are infinitely many mathematicians standing in front of them. So the question is, what can they do? Okay, or is there some amount of water that could possibly uh, quench the thirst of all these mathematicians? And it turns out there absolutely is an amount of, mo or an amount of water that would be enough for them. Let's draw a visual to understand it. The first person asks for a glass of water. Not a problem. Any person working in a restaurant can pour a glass of water. Okay, that's fine and dandy. The next person asks for a half glass of water. Okay, so we fill that half full. Their glass is half full, so to speak. Okay, the next person wants a quarter glass of water. Now, sure, we could keep getting new cups all day, but this person thinks, geez, I mean, these people don't even want a whole cup of water to, all together to share. So what they're going to do is they're going to pour that quarter cup of water into this same glass. So here's the question. Of this empty space, what portion of that is filled by a quarter cup? Okay, remember, this is half a cup of water empty. That's half a cup of water full. And so this quarter is going to fill half of that empty space. So there's the one-fourth. What about the one-eighth? We're going to put the one-eighth in the same cup. How much of this space is filled? Well, half of that space is filled by the one-eighth. And then the one-sixteenth? Well, half of that space is filled. The next one will be one-thirty-second. Half of that space is filled. And it just, I hope you can see, it keeps filling that space, half of that space, each time we add the next mathematician. So does this glass ever get full? Well, kind of. You end up kind of splitting hairs on this. Well, you know, we get down to the last molecule of water or something like that. Um, Technically speaking, no, it never gets full, but it gets so close to being full that, that would be enough. So what does the person behind the counter do? They pour two full glasses of water and say, fine, are you satisfied? And all the mathematicians are satisfied because two glasses of water is plenty for them. So here's from a mathematical perspective what's interesting about that. We have an infinite list of numbers here. And when you add all those numbers together, you get two. That can be a really confusing concept at first. How can infinitely many numbers be two? We looked at the example last time. We had one plus two plus three plus four and so on. And we said, hey, that adds up to be, you know, infinitely large. Of course it does. We're adding more um, infinitely many numbers together. It's infinitely large. But in this case, it's not. So that's what we're going to be looking at in today's video. We're going to try to figure out how can we tell when a list of numbers adds up to a whole number, when is it infinite? And specifically, we're going to look at both finite and infinite geometric series. So let's then figure out what is a geometric series. We sort of already talked about it. It's defined by, by the operation of multiplication. Okay, so here we have an example. Okay, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. The thing we're multiplying by is called the common ratio. I have that in bold because it's an important vocabulary term that comes up a lot. Okay, we call the common ratio R. That's usually how it's denoted. In this example, R is 2. Okay, and then in our books, you'll see that typically the way they write it out is like this. Okay, they're going to say a sub n, the nth term, is a sub 1, r to the n minus 1. Let's annotate this. What's a sub 1? That's the first term. What's r? r is the common ratio. The thing we're multiplying by. So if you know those two pieces of information, it's very easy to write out the nth term, okay? Please note that it says n minus 1. We're going to talk about why that is just a little bit later, why that has to be n minus 1. Okay, when we write it out, what does it look like? It looks like, oh my goodness, that's a lot of stuff. Okay, don't get symbol shocked by this, okay? All this says, this is the first term, and this is the first term, but it was multiplied by r, that thing we multiply. Now remember, to get to the next step, you just multiply by r. So that's what it says, that thing times r. To get to the next one, you multiply by r again, by r again by r again, until you get all the way to the 
final term, the nth term. Okay, and there it is. So let's look at an example. We want to find the nth term of this series. Okay, 4, 12, 36, 108, and we're also going to find the 13th term. Okay, so let's start here. We know that the definition is that we say a sub n, the nth term is the first term, which is 4, times the common ratio. All right, we're going to have to think about that for a minute. To get to the next term, what are we multiplying by? It looks like it's 3. So times 3 to the n minus 1. Okay. Now, the only thing I'm missing, I need to put this in parentheses to demonstrate that it's multiplied. Here, there are two different variables, so we don't have to have the parentheses, but when it's numeric, we're going to have to do that. And then let's do a quick check and make sure it's right. So if n is 1, and we plug in a 1, then what happens? Then we see that a sub 1 equals 4 times 3 to the 1 minus 1. That 1 minus 1 becomes 4 times 3 to the 0, and we know 3 to the 0 is 1. So that's four, so that's good, they match. Now, that's what the n minus one is about, and that's why we need it, okay? Because if you don't have the n minus one, when you plug in one for your first term, you end up with three to the first power, and then four times three gives us 12. So what that really would do is it would spit out the second term, since our index is off, and every one of our terms would be off by one. It'd be the right numbers, but they'd be in the wrong locations. Okay, so that's why we avoid that. Let's go to question two. What's the 13th term? a sub 13, all that's going to be is 4 times 3 to the n minus 1, that's 13 minus 1, okay, or 4 times 3 to the 12th. Now, I'm not at all expecting you to do that in your head, so I'm going to actually grab a calculator right now. So I'm going to have 3 to the 12th, I'm going to multiply that by 4, and holy moly, that's a big number. Okay, what do I get? I get 2,125,000. 764. Okay, so there we go. That's how it's done. Let's do another one. Okay, what about this one? I think this would be a really good chance. Actually, let's put two up. I think this would be a really good chance for you to try to pause the video, try these on your own. I'm going to explain them quickly, but build in time when you watch this video so that you have time to think about it, so that you have time to write, because otherwise it's going to go really quickly for you. Okay, for this one, the nth term, all I have to do is recognize what the first term is. I have to recognize what the pattern is. It's dividing by 10, which is the same as multiplying by 1 tenth, and then it's to the n minus 1. That's it. Okay, what about this one? a sub n equals the first term. We always put that first, and then we need to know what are we multiplying by, and it's n minus 1. Now, in class, some people said, hey, it's multiplying by 3. Mm, not quite. It looks like maybe it's dividing by 3. Okay, so divide by 3, and that's not quite right either because, look, we have that negative right there. Now, we don't have a lot of information here, but it looks like this is alternating. So we're going to put a little minus right there. Being able to write out a list of numbers or being able to take a list of numbers and write the rule for it is all fine and good. But what's far more interesting is if you actually wanted to add all those up. Okay? And so what we're going to show now is how do we do that. And similarly to how we had the example with Carl Gauss in the previous video, um, we're going to have the method for how you determine how to add those up. So what about when you want to sum up all the terms of the sequence? So if you wanted to have the sum, you take the first and the second and the third term and so on, and you would add them all together. Now, it's really hard to formalize that. We don't know how many numbers are in this list. So the creative way to find an equation for this is to subtract the same thing, but multiplied by R. Now, what does that do? Now, notice we're subtracting this entire list, kind of like elimination back in Algebra 1. So notice, these two terms are the same thing. Something minus itself cancels out. These two terms are the same thing. Something minus itself cancels out. What about this term? Where's its pair? Or where's its partner? Well, it's hidden in these ellipses, so it's going to cancel out. These ones have partners, so something minus itself will cancel out. And this one has a partner down in the ellipsis, so that cancels out. So when the dust settles, what's left? Okay, we have S sub n minus R S sub n equals, we have an A sub 1 left over, the first term, and we have an A sub 1 R to the n, so minus A sub 1 R to the n. All right, now we can simplify that out, or maybe not simplify, we can sort of massage this until it looks like something a little bit more useful. So what I'm going to do is factor out an S sub n, so I get 1 minus r. Over here, I can factor something out too. I can factor out a sub 1, and I get 1 minus r to the nth power. 
Now, keep in mind, what we were after this whole time, how do you add all the numbers together? That's this right here. It's how do I add them all together? The sum of all the numbers. So what I'm going to do is try to get that little chunk by itself. So I'm going to divide by 1 minus r, divide by 1 minus r, and then the way we typically write this, s sub n equals a sub 1 multiplied by the quantity 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. Okay, and let's annotate that. Sum of a geometric sequence. All right, now you're probably going to want to box that in your notes. This is one of our key ideas of the day. Okay, and so what information is needed to write down or to determine the sum of a geometric sequence? You need to know the first number in the list, first term. You need to know the common ratio. And you need to know n, how many terms there are in the list. So let's look at an example or two. Okay, let's try this one. First thing we need to determine, is this geometric? Let's see. Geometric was when it looked like a sub 1 times r to the n minus 1. I'm writing that right here so we can compare. Now because I've written that, we can say, hey, look at that. That's a 5, so 5 is a sub 1. And we've got our r right there. And this i minus 1 matches n minus 1. Don't be frightened by the sigma. All that's telling us is, hey, by the way, you need to add these together, which is perfect because we just derived a way to add them all together. So here I go. So our rule that we just wrote down said you start with a, min or a sub 1. So I'm going to put in the 5. 1 minus r. r is 0.8. Okay. And we want to raise that to the n minus 1 power. Or excuse me, to the nth power for our rule. Well, how many numbers are there in this list? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That's 7. Down here, we have 1 minus r. So 1 minus 0.8. And that's our setup. And so now it's going to be calculator time. Now, the one mistake that I see a lot of students make when they try this is their, or their calculator gets a little bit confused. The way you can solve that, put your entire numerator in parentheses, put your entire denominator in parentheses, and then hit that divide button in between them, and then your calculator will understand exactly what you mean. See, calculators don't read subtlety very well. They need to know exactly what you mean. So I'm going to go ahead and type this into mine real quick. 1 minus 0.8 to the 7th. Close the parentheses. Divide by 1 minus 0.8. Or if you want to just type in 0.2, that would be fine. And what do we get? I get 19.76. I'm going to round my answer. So I'm going to use the little approximately symbol. So it's about 19.76. Okay. And I hope you can see already, this process was a lot easier than writing out all the terms, calculating them, simplifying them, and adding them together. So this is our little shortcut. The other thing that's important is what if this number had been 87? Well, that would be a really horrible calculation to do by hand. How does it change this, though? All it would do is we type in 87 in the calculator. So that's a nice little shortcut for us. Okay, let's try another one. Okay, in this one, people can get a little bit confused. We're used to seeing a sub 1, r to the n minus 1. So I've got my sort of r to the n minus 1 business right here. So I can see that r is 2. That's fine. But what's the first term? Okay, there's two ways of thinking about it. If there were a number here and it were multiplied and it wasn't going to change what we see, it would have to be a one. So that would tell you the first term is one. However, if you don't like to do it in that theoretical way and you really want to have something that you can sort of plug and chug, what you could do to find the first term is just always plug in that one. And then we'd see it's two to the one minus one, which would be two to the zero which would be 1, which is exactly what I said it would be. So that's two different ways of understanding this. Now let's set it up. So what we have is 1, 1 minus r, that's 2, to the, let's how many numbers? 1 to 8, that's 8 numbers. Okay, and we're going to put that over 1 minus r, and r is 2. And now it's calculator time. So let's do it. So 1 minus 2 to the 8. And divided by 1 minus 2. And when I do that, I get 255. So again, I hope you can see that was a lot quicker than writing out eight numbers and adding them together. This quickly and easily adds that up. Okay. But what about when that list goes on to infinity? How does that change things? In this example, what we would have 2 to the 1 minus 1, our first number would be 1, and then 2, and then 4, and then 8 dot, dot, dot. And I hope you can see that th those numbers are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And so this is going to be infinite. 
Now, or it's not an eight, it's infinity. So that's a little different than what we saw at the beginning of the video. One plus a half plus a fourth, oops, one fourth plus one eighth, dot, 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 and that equaled two. Okay, it's very different. So what's the difference? And what's happening in our equation that's causing that difference is, is part of what's really important. So let's go back up to our little equation and see how that'll apply when we have an infinite number of terms. So if you have an infinite geometric series, geometric series. So what that would mean is, sure, we would still have a first term, we would still have a pattern, we still have a common ratio, but that means that n equals infinity. There are infinitely many terms. So the only thing in this equation that's affected is that r to the n. So that becomes r to the infinity. And so the question is, um, what does that mean if r is raised to the infinite power? Well, let's look at some numerical examples to understand. What if I take two to the infinite power? So that would mean two times two times two times two times two times two forever. Infinitely many twos multiplied by each other. So what you'd notice is that you keep multiplying by two that keeps getting bigger. So that would be infinite. Okay, so that blows this whole thing up. Okay, what about if we did 1.1? to the infinite power. What would that mean? That'd be 1.1 times 1.1 times 1.1 forever. What it really comes down to is when you multiply by 1.1, does it, do you make your quantity larger or smaller? Okay, it definitely makes it larger, so that's gonna be infinite. What if we had one to the infinite power? That'd be one times one times one times one times of a whole bunch of ones. Some would say that's an indeterminate form. Some would argue that it's one. You could make the case either way. But the one that's really clear is if I do like 0.9 to the infinite power. And the way to think about it is if I multiply by 0.9 over and over and over, or if I, even if I multiply by it one time, am I making my quantity larger or smaller? Each time I multiply by 0.9, the quantity gets smaller. And so if I multiply by 0.9 infinitely many times, if I make it smaller infinitely many times, eventually it gets so small that it's zero. What if it's one half? If it's one half to the infinity, I keep chopping it in half every time. Eventually that goes to zero. So if this little guy has certain cases, like when r is less than one, that's the cases, when that number we're multiplying is by less than one, and technically it's the absolute value, so I'm gonna add that in, then r to the infinity in those cases equals zero. Now, given that it equals zero, let's rewrite this equation. I'm gonna do it over here. Okay, so I would have a sub one times one minus zero over one minus r. I can simplify that. So that would then be a sub one times one, that's a sub one. And then I have one minus r. That just got a lot easier. So this now, is the equation for how you sum up an infinite geometric series. So you might make that little note. You're going to want that in your notes. And the other thing, and guys, you got to you got to really circle this box. It, it's the thing that a lot of people forget. Okay, I'm going to do it in multiple colors so it stands out because uh, my experience as a teacher tells me people will forget this. Okay, it only works if your common ratio is between negative one and one. That's just what this says in fancy notation. Okay, so let's run down and let's try this real quick. Let's practice it. Okay, with a few examples. So let's go back to that first example we did in the video today. In this example, we already saw that the answer is two. So let's see if we can verify that. Remembering that our new rule for an infinite geometric series is a sub one over one minus r. So first term is one, so I get one over one minus the common ratio, which is one half. Hey, I can do mental math on this one. One minus a half is one half, so I get one over one half. How do you divide by a fraction? You flip it and it becomes multiplication. So I get one multiplied by two over one, which is two, exactly like we thought it should be. Let's try another one. What about this one? This would be a great time to pause the video and try it. Now, if you pause the video and tried this on your own, what did you get? Okay, a lot of people will start out by saying, hey, I know the first term is eight, and I have one minus three halves, and then I, that ends up being eight over negative one half, and flip that and multiply it, and I get negative 16, and they go, yay, I'm so smart. Okay, hold on a second. The first number in this list is eight. 
when you multiply by three halves, that's like 1.5, right? So this is a list of positive numbers, and you're telling me that when you add a list of positive numbers, you get a negative. Okay, so that's exactly what I warned you about a minute ago. This rule only applies when we have satisfied this condition right here. Okay, so R has to be between negative 1 and 1. Let's go down and check that and see what's going on. Maybe that'll explain why we're having issues. Okay, so right here, I can see that R equals 3 halves. Is that between 1 and negative 1? No, it's not. So this rule does not apply. So all this, I mean, it's nice that we plug numbers in the formula. However, we've applied a rule that does not apply in this case. Now, it's common that you'll get a negative answer if you've made that mistake, or you'll get an answer that's the opposite of what logically it should be. You should not be able to add up a whole bunch of positive numbers and get a negative answer. So what are we going to say then? So first of all, we're adding a bunch of positive numbers, so we might say the answer is infinity. That would be correct, by the way. Or we might say that this series diverges. Okay, I really like infinity. Diverges is also correct. But when you say infinity, it explains why it diverges. All right, what about the next one? Okay, in this one, we have an infinite series. It is geometric, so I get my first term, 26 over 1 minus the common ratio, 0.8. Type that in a calculator, and you get 130. So, guys, I hope you see how quick and easy that is, okay? It's a lot quicker and easier than having to write out, well, you couldn't write out infinitely many terms. But even compared to having to do a visual for the glass of water problem with all the infinitely many mathematicians, this is going to be a lot quicker and easier. All right, that's going to be it for today's video. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time.